All right, now in chapter number 26 here again, um, just to bring you up to, to speed, chapter 24, 25, 26, basically Paul just has to keep on re repeating himself and reiterating and, and pleading his cause before Felix, Festus, Agrippa, now is who we're dealing with in, in 26, and Agrippa's the king, right? So, so we, we, we've seen Felix, we've seen Festus. Festus is still here, but this is now when King Agrippa comes down and he wants to hear for himself. He he's, wants to hear what Paul has to say. And um, in verse number one, we start off there. It says, Then Agrippa said to Paul, Thou art permitted to speak for thyself. So he's, he's, Paul's brought in, and, and Agrippa's basically saying, Okay, you know, you could, you could talk now. You could speak freely for yourself. He's given him the floor. Then Paul stretched forth the hand and answered for himself, I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because I shall answer for myself this day before thee, touching all the things whereby I am accused of the Jews, especially because I know thee to be expert in all customs and questions which are among the Jews, wherefore I beseech thee to hear me patiently. So he's saying how glad he is that, that Agrippa's here. He's like, I know that you're familiar with, with the Jews' customs and our laws, he, and, and, and he's saying, I'm glad now that you're going to hear me, since you're expert in these ways, you know about them. Um, I, you know, it's not like he has to explain it to him. So now he's asking, he's like, please just be patient and listen to me patiently. You know, just, just hear me out here. Verse number um, four, he says, and he gives him this history of himself, explaining who he is. He says, my manner of life from my youth, which was at the first among mine own nation at Jerusalem, know all the Jews. He's saying, look, everybody knows how I grew up. Everyone knew, um, knows how I grew up as a Jew. Verse 5, it says, which knew me from the beginning, if they would testify that after the most straightest sect of our religion, I lived a Pharisee. He's look, I grew up in the straightest sect, right? I was zealous. I, was, I grew up a Pharisee. Look, they all know it. If they would testify, if they would come here tonight and just, and just say, you know, give you my background, it would line up. They all knew, knew me. They, they know that I was a Pharisee. I, I, I lived, I abided by the straightest sect. And he goes on to explain how zealous he was. Um, a little bit later, um, where he said, you know, he went and persecuted people. But um, look at verse number, uh, man, I lost my place already. Number six, he says, And now I stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made of God unto our fathers, unto which promise our twelve tribes, instantly serving God day and night, hope to come. For which hope's sake, King Agrippa, I am accused of the Jews. So, he starts off giving his, you know, a, a real brief history of who he is, that he lived a Pharisee, and basically just saying, the whole reason I'm before you is because of the hope that God has given unto us. And, and basically, he's, he's trying to use that to say that the Jews believe essentially the same in the same hope, right? The hope of the resurrection. The Pharisees believed that. Now, they didn't believe it was Jesus Christ was the Christ. They didn't believe Jesus was the Christ. But they still believe in the resurrection of that. He's just saying, he's essentially just saying, look, that's why I'm calling question before you today is because of that hope, because of that promise of God. That's why I'm here before you. Look what he says in verse 8. This is real interesting. He says, why should it be thought a thing incredible with you that God should raise the dead? So he, now he brings this question up to, to um, Agrippa. And you notice what he, what he ends up doing here. He's not so much in this chapter, he's not so much pleading his cause so much, because right here he's basically just is done saying that, you know, I grew up a Pharisee and the whole reason I'm here is, is because of the hope of resurrection. But he kind of turns this into, into like a soul winning effort for Agrippa. So he starts off, he gives this question to King Agrippa. He says, why should it be thought a thing incredible with you that God should raise the dead? So why is it an incredible thing? And think about that word, incredible, right? Incredible means not credible. You think of a person has credibility. Um, it's, it's how truthful they are, right? How, how, how truthful a person is, how honest a person is, how credible you'll be. If you're, if you're telling lies, you're not going to be a very credible person. So he's saying, why should we thought a thing incredible, like it, like it can't happen, that God should raise the dead? And that's a great question because um, if you believe in God, if you believe God is all-powerful, if you believe God created the heaven and the earth, if you believe God is, is, is really a God of might and power and truly a God, he's, his, his power is, is limitless, right? 
And, and why should it be thought that it's such a big deal that, that it would be so incredible for somebody to actually be brought back to life by, the pow by God's power, by God's hand? Why is that a thing that's in incredible? Why would that be so hard to believe, right? Yet we have so many people today that, that want to deny the miracles of the Bible. They want to discount, you know, these events. There, I mean, there's even, you know, people have released documentaries, and you'll find these documentaries on things like, you know, the History Channel or Discovery Channel or whatever, and they'll be like mysteries of the Bible, and they'll try to explain, you know, scientifically how these different events could have happened. And basically what they're doing is they're minimizing the miracles of God, and they don't want to, they don't believe in a God that's capable of doing these things. A God that's able to just completely part a sea. They have to say, oh no, no. Well, you see, it could have just been a natural phenomenon where this wind passed through this tunnel, you know, and these mountains and it just happened. Yeah, right. Yeah. It's a bunch of nonsense is what it is. But there's these people that don't want to believe in the power, in a, in a truly all-powerful God. That, that is capable of doing all these things. And, he, and he's basically, I mean, he's not going into as much detail as I have, but he's just basically bringing that question up to, to Agrippa saying, why should in the world should be thought a thing incredible that God should raise the dead? And, you know, it's the same type of question I'd like to ask people today who don't believe that God has preserved his word for us today with the Bible. The people who will say that, well, I believe that the words of God are infallible and inerrant and, and were perfect in the original autographs, is what they'll say. In the original, so what, when it was originally penned down, yeah, those words were perfect. Yet they're failing to believe in a God that is capable of preserving his word through men. The same way, I mean, God's able to use, they believe that God's able to use a man to write down some words that are God's words. Yet they don't believe that God is able to use another man to just copy those words. Now, how ridiculous is that? I mean, which is harder? Is it harder to just copy the words that are already given? Or is it harder to actually get the, the, the new message from God, to get his actual words firsthand and write that down? I mean, it's a lot harder. I think it happens a lot less frequently that people actually receive that, that um, the testimony from God, receive God's word to even write down to begin with. And they think it's a thing incredible that God should preserve his word, whether it be through different languages or whether it be just through time itself, that, that somehow that there's no way that God's perfect preserved word can be here with us today. You think that's incredible? They don't believe in a powerful God. And they don't believe the promises of God because in multiple places throughout the Bible... In the book of Psalms and in elsewhere, God promises to preserve his words, he says, for, you know, from this generation and forever. And, and, and he says that in multiple ways that, that his word will be spoken and, and um, passed on through the generations forever. And God's word is, is eternal in itself. Um, I don't think it should be thought a thing incredible that God can do such things. And that's what he's, he's bringing up here in verse 8 to King Agrippa. Is it really that incredible that God should raise the dead? You know, God, God's the one who gives life. Why is, it, why is it such an incredible thing that God brings back from the dead? Let's continue reading here, verse number 9. He says, I verily thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth, which thing I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints did I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests. And when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them. And I punished them oft in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme. And being exceedingly mad against them, I persecuted them even unto strange cities. Now, um, we see here the stuff that's holy just skipped over some, some points on the last point. Let's jump back to that real quick before we get into to what Paul, because I, I, I totally skipped over the scriptures I wanted to bring up on is anything to, you know, on things being incredible with you that God should raise the dead. Um, we'll get right back into what we just read here in Acts 9, uh, 26 9. But um, Genesis 18, 
when I read this verse initially while I was studying for the sermon, why should we thought that thing incredible with you that God should raise the dead? It kind of reminded me of, of some other verses about is anything too hard for the Lord? In Genesis 18, um, when, when God had told Abraham that Sarah was going to conceive seed and bring forth a son, um, Sarah laughed at herself and, and you know, basically said, shall I have pleasure, my, you know, my Lord being so old? And, you know, I mean, Abraham was 100 years old, Sarah was 90 years old, and, and basically, I mean, they're, they're, they're old people, and she's gonna, she finds out she's going to have a baby, she laughs within herself. And in Genesis 18, 13, it says, And the Lord said unto Abraham, Wherefore did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I of a surety bear a child which am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the time appointed, I will return unto thee according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. So again, I mean, we see, we see the seemingly impossible, right? And a 100-year-old man and a 90-year-old woman saying, Oh yeah, they're going to have a baby. You're going to have a brand new baby. And not only that, I mean, Sarah was able to wean the baby. She was able to feed the baby. Her body worked miraculously the way it's the way the normal people that, you know, you're not, you're not going to have a baby. But when God says something's going to happen, God is that power. Was anything too hard? You think it's really that hard that God breaks a sweat in, in, in making an older woman have a child or in, you know, raising the dead or whatever for that matter? Jeremiah 32, 17 says, Ah, Lord God, behold. Thou hast made the heaven and the earth by thy great power and stretched out arm, and there is nothing too hard for thee. I mean, when you contemplate how vast the universe is and that God created everything by speaking it into existence, God is truly powerful. And the little things that we, on a daily basis, might think are impossible. There's no way that could happen. Well, with men, this is impossible. With God, all things are possible. Don't ever lose sight of the fact that, that God is an extremely powerful God and that God is capable of, of doing anything and that nothing is too hard for God. Things that might be too hard for us, things we might look at and say that's impossible. I mean, the well, Bible says that if you have grain, uh, faith as a grain of a mustard seed, you should say unto this mountain, be thou removed, and you know, and you can do it. You, you can move mountains. He's saying you can you can do the impossible if you have faith in God. Why can you do those things? Because God's the one that has the power. God's God. You know, it wasn't by Moses' strength and Moses' own power that he powered the Red Sea. It wasn't by Moses' strength that he turned the water. But it was all God's power. God did it. God worked through the man to do those amazing miracles. The power came from God. Moses had the faith. Moses was told of God, he heard God's word, he did what God was telling him to do, and God's the one that, that had the power to use him to do those great miracles. And God is a God of miracles even today. God is, not, is, is only limited by our lack of faith. We are fully capable, nothing is too hard for the Lord, that hasn't changed he can do miracles today. He can part seas today if he wants to. Anyone he wants to use. Hey, look, Elijah made it not rain for three years upon the earth based on his prayer, based on his faith, his faithful prayer. The Bible says the fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. If you're living a righteous life, you have faith in God, you're praying to God, hey, God wants to use people to, to do miracles even today. I believe that. And, and it's just, it's, he's limited by our own um, lack of faith. Now, all of these things may seem impossible. These, you know, raising the dead. And without God, it is impossible. But what's interesting is that this is the very thing we must believe in order to be saved. See, God raised the dead, right? And that's what, that's what he's asking King River about. Thing, thing incredible with you. Yeah, raising the dead is impossible without God. But for our salvation, what do we need to believe? We say we need to believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, right? We need that is that is important. I believe that's why he's bringing it up to Agrippa. You think it's incredible? God should raise the dead. Hey, you need to believe that God raises the dead. You need to believe that. Hey, God's going to raise us up one day. We need to believe in the resurrection in order to be saved. But. Um, Let's, let's keep reading here now. We already read verses 9, 10, and 11. 
Now where he's, he's going back and saying, you know, I thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. He's saying, you know, he, he starts with a question, do you think it's incredible I got to raise the dead? And then he starts saying, well, look, even I, you know, thought that I should be doing things contrary to Christ. You know, I, I didn't get it at first. I was out and, and persecuting the church. I was out, um, he says, many of the saints that I shut up in prison. I was arresting the saints. I was arresting these believers. I had authority from the chief priests. It says that when they were put to death, so he was going out and, and, and arresting Christians. He was arresting the saints. He was putting them into prison, and, then he's, and, and they were being put to death by the Jews, mind you, by the chief priests, by the Pharisees, by the Jews, by the same people. You know, Paul was a Pharisee. He was arresting the people and having them put to death. He says, when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them. Not only was he consenting to their death, he, he was giving his voice against them, saying, yeah, they deserve to die, and, and whatever it was they needed to say to get them put to death. Verse 11 says, and I punished them oft in every synagogue and compelled them, excuse me, to blaspheme. Another interesting statement there is saying that, that he, was, he was trying to get them to blaspheme. Probably what he's doing is getting them to deny Christ, to trying to get the saints to say, to renounce Christ, to say that Jesus wasn't the Christ, and, and was compelling them to blaspheme God. And it says, And being exceedingly mad against them, I persecuted them even unto strange seasons. Now, the word mad, of course, when, when you see the word mad in the Bible, it's, it's not talking about anger or being angry. When it's talking about someone being angry, it's talking about being angry. Mm -hmm. Mad is like, is like just nuts, right? Um, it's like the British mad, right? You think I'm mad? And you're... <laughs> And that's, they use that word like, like, like you're crazy, right? He was so just, just exceedingly just, just crazy over this stuff that he persecuted him even on the strength. So he's like, I, I didn't let it go. Even though I live in Jerusalem and I was doing everything in Jerusalem, he couldn't, he couldn't let it go. He had to just chase after these people and just try to stamp out all the, all the saints. Let's keep reading here. It says in verse 12, it says, Whereupon as I went to Damascus with authority... And commission from the chief priest. Now he's going to tell him about his his his, um, his vision and what he saw Jesus Christ and when Jesus appeared to him. At midday, O king, I saw in the way a light from heaven above the brightness of the sun, shining round about me and them which journeyed with me. And when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest, but rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness, both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. So now he explains his whole, you know, his vision and seeing Jesus Christ in the way. And it's a great testimony that Paul is able to give here because he went from one extreme to the other. He went from being on the front lines of being against the Christians, being against Christ, being against the saints, and persecuting them, and arresting them, and giving his voice against them so that they could be put to death. He went from, from vehemently, madly going after them and persecuting them to being one of them, to receiving Christ, to, to believing on him and, and, and having the veil removed, the scales removed from his eyes and being able to see the truth and, and, and to receive the truth. And it's such a powerful witness for someone like him to give because, every, like I said, everyone knew that he was a Pharisee. After the straightest sect, he lived a Pharisee. He, he was devout, right? He, I mean, he really was into his religion. But, um, so for someone to, to, to really, to make that kind of a change is a big deal. And um, look what Jesus, his commandment for Paul was in verse 16. His commission from Jesus Christ, it says, For I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness. So he said, Paul's, Jesus was saying to Paul, look, I appeared unto you so that you could be a minister. Minister means, you know, you're, you're going to serve other people. You're going to be ministering unto other people and a witness. 
The things that you've seen now, everything that you see here, you're, a, you're, you're going to be a witness for me and a minister. It says, both of these things which I have seen and of the things in which I will appear unto thee. So he's saying, everything you saw here in the way, and also I'm going to appear unto you later, those things later, you're also going to witness of those, and you're going to be a minister. It says, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee. So now Jesus is telling Paul as well that, you know, in, on, his on this road to Damascus, Jesus tells him that he's going to be sent unto the Gentiles. That's why he was the apostle of the Gentiles. He was supposed to go and, and be a witness and a minister for the Gentiles. Um, that was his, primarily who he was sent to. Verse 18 says, To open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. So he's sending him out to the Gentiles to get him saved. He's, he's, an, he's being sent out to be an, uh, he's an apostle, but he's not sent out to be an evangelist. Right? He's out to, he goes out, he ends up starting churches and getting a lot of people saved, specifically in the Gentiles. Now, look where it says there, it's this phrase where it says, turning them from, um, you know, the power of, from the power of Satan unto God. Uh, what is the power of Satan? See, Satan does not want people getting saved. Satan is our adversary. Satan is the enemy. Satan is out, is out doing everything against us. He's an accuser of the brethren. He's out accusing us to God. Satan does not want people getting saved. Satan does not want us obeying God. Even if you are saved, he wants, it, he wants it, you to backslide. He wants you to get out of church. He wants you to get out of service from the Lord. The Bible says in, um, in Luke 22... Jesus Christ said this to, to Peter. He says, And the Lord said, in verse 31, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. He wants to sift. He, wa he wants to you know, shake you up and, just, and, and toss you up. He really wants to have his way with you. He says, But I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. So Jesus Christ's prayer for him is that, because Satan has desired to have him, and he wants to sift him as wheat, he wants to, to put him in all kinds of turmoil, he wants to, to, to inflict pain on him, essentially, he says, I pray for that, that faith fail not. So when these hard times come, when Satan comes and attacks you, you know, don't let your faith fail. Keep your faith in God, don't lose that faith. Jesus Christ prayed that his faith wouldn't fail. And then in, uh, in Job, we see a little bit more about Satan too, because we're we're trying to figure out here the, the power of Satan, right? You need to turn people from the power of Satan unto God. In Job chapter 2, verse 4, it says, And Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, yea, all that a man hath will he give for his life. But put forth thine hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse thee to thy faith. face. This was um, Satan talking about Job, right? If you remember in the book of Job, in chapter 1 and in chapter 2, Say, you know, God says to Satan, Satan, you know, whence comest thou? Where, you know, where are you coming from? And he goes, oh, from walking to and fro in the earth. And God says, so have you considered my servant Job? You know, that there's not a man like him on the earth, that he's, you know, he walks in integrity of heart, that, he, you know, that he's basically an upright and righteous man. And this is when Satan just, he just starts spouting off his mouth and lying about Job. He doesn't tell the truth, he lies to him. And, he, and he's trying to provoke God. And what he's doing is he's accusing the brethren, he's accusing Job in this story, but what he does is he's just always trying to accuse the saints to God. And his accusation here of Job, he's saying, look, if you touch his flesh, if you make him sick, if you cause him to lose his health, he will curse you to your face. That's what he was, saying. That's what he was accusing Job of. Now, did Job do that? No, he didn't. Satan was lying. He was, he was just making false, railing accusations against God's people, against Job. And, um, but this is what Satan does. You need to be, to be aware of this because Satan continues to do this. this is, we're, not, we're not ignorant of his devices. And this is what, you know, people need to be turned from the power of Satan unto God. Now, what is that power that Satan has? Well, in Luke chapter 4, is we see the, uh, the events of Jesus Christ being tempted in the wilderness. You remember when Satan went to, to Jesus Christ and he tempted him uh, three times, essentially. And, and, of course, Jesus withstood him. 
And in one of those times, it says in Luke 4, verse 5, it says, And the devil, taking him up into a high mountain, showed on him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. So he brings him up this high mountain, and he shows that he's able to, you know, in a way he's able to perform this miracle of showing Jesus all the kingdoms of the world in just a moment of time. He's able to just say, see, here's all the kingdoms. And he says, and the devil said unto him, all this power will I give thee, and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will, I give it. If thou therefore wilt worship me, all shall be thine. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Now, Satan does have power on this earth. Satan does have a certain power. That's why people need to be turned from the power of Satan unto God. See, Satan has power over these, these kingdoms of the world. He was able to, to, to give Jesus this power, which Jesus knew he didn't need to get that power from Satan because if he, if he did what he was supposed to do, obviously Jesus Christ is going to come and rule and reign all the kingdoms of the earth for a thousand years. He didn't need to receive that kingdom from Satan before the appointed time. He's going to get the kingdom and he'll be in charge. He'll have the kingdom forever. Right? He didn't need to get anything from Satan to, if he would fall out worship him. But see, this is how Satan operates. And Satan will give this, and even if he doesn't have this power, he'll lie to you about it. He'll, 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 you know, he wants you to, to, he uses these powers of, of wealth and fame and power to seduce people, to get people under his spell, under his power to, to follow him. And that's why so many people these days are so wrapped up and caught up in the cares of this world, in the riches of this world, in, in, in attaining power, attaining wealth, attaining political power, whatever it may be. These things are, are basically the power of Satan. And, and, and he's, Jesus was telling Paul that he needs to go out and turn people from, from darkness to light. Satan is darkness. God is light. To turn them from the power of Satan unto God. So that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them, which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 19 of Acts 26. Verse 19 says, Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision, but showed first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coasts of Judea, and then to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. Now, this topic comes up over and over again throughout the book of Acts, and throughout the Bible for that matter. And if you're here on Sunday night, we preached on, um, on the book of Jonah, and I spent quite a bit of time going into repentance. In Jonah uh, chapter 3, verse 10, is a great definition for repentance, how it works. I'm not going to re-preach that. I preached that on Sunday night. You can hear the, 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 see the video if you didn't get a chance to be here for that. But we see, and it's a common theme throughout the book of Acts, and it's amazing how it all, if you have a, if you have a biblical understanding of repentance, it all lines up, every single verse matches up perfectly. And that we understand that it's not works. He tells here, you know, he preached for the people to repent and turn to God. That's one thing, right? It says, um, and then to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God. That would be their salvation, right? They needed to repent. Meaning that whatever they were trusting in, if they were trusting in false gods, they were trusting in idols, whatever it was that they were trusting in, hey, they had to repent and believe on Jesus Christ. They had to repent and turn to God. They had to believe on God. They had to put their faith on Jesus Christ to be saved. That was the saving salvation that they need. But he didn't just stop there. It says, and do works meet for repentance. He taught them not just being saved in that sin. He also taught them, hey, also do works meet for repentance. Do the works you know, that, are, that are worthy, that show that, that you did have this repentance. And, you know, I can relate to this. I got saved when I was 20 years old. I put my faith on Jesus Christ. I know exactly the, the night that I got saved. And um, it wasn't from a soul order coming to my door. I don't, I don't know exactly who along the way had, had preached God's word unto me. I know I'd obviously heard it. But I know specifically the night in which I called upon the name of the Lord, in which I put my faith in Jesus Christ, 
and he saved me. And from that moment forward, even the next morning, I knew that I was saved. I tr I tried to tell my roommates about it. I didn't really know much. I just know that I knew I put my faith in Christ, and I knew that he saved me. And I told my family about it. I told my friends about it. But I, I lived kind of a wicked lifestyle. There were things I liked to do that I shouldn't have been doing. There were a lot of drinking and partying and, and whatever. And I didn't give those things up. Now, was I saved? Absolutely. I put my faith in Jesus Christ to save my soul. I knew I couldn't go to heaven on my own at all. I knew that my works weren't going to save me. I knew that I was a wicked sinner. I knew it. Now, did I know all the Bible? Had I read all the Bible? No. Of course not. But I did know I needed to be saved, and I did know that the only way to be saved was put my faith in Christ, and I did that. Now, as the years went by, sometimes I would feel an urge, like, hey, I should go to church. I should try to get, you know, do, learn more about God and do what's right. And other times I kind of just pushed it out of my mind and I just kept doing whatever it was that I wanted to do. Hanging out with my buddies, doing, doing a lot of the same things. Hey, if I, I could have died at any moment, whether it be, uh, you know, from just over binge drinking or, or drugs or whatever. I, there's a lot of things that could have happened to me. I could, have, I could have got killed in a car accident. And I know that I was saved. And, and someone might have looked at me and been like, he didn't do any works meet for repentance. But that did not make me not saved. Now, throughout those years, there, were, there have been a few times where I would doubt my salvation because I would, I would ask myself this question. And I would say, well, I believe the Bible, but, but if I really believe these things, if I really believe this to be true, then why am I doing these things? The things I knew that were wrong. Now, I might not have known how much of everything was wrong, but, for example, going out and getting drunk, I knew was wrong. I had already seen that in the Bible. I knew that was a sin. I knew it. And I didn't argue with it. I might have made up excuses a few times. I didn't, I didn't really want to dig into it very much because I kind of knew what the answer was already. But when people would say things, oh, yeah, Jesus turned water into wine, you know, that gave me a little bit of comfort to just say, oh, yeah, okay, well, yeah, it probably is okay then. Without looking at it, right? Because you hear the one little thing, you don't want to know all the truth about it when you're, when you're guilty of committing the sin. At least I didn't. I didn't really want to hear it. Okay, um, there was a point where I did get right with it, obviously, but um, I didn't want to hear about it. Now... I did end up, because of things like that, I would question my own salvation. I'd say, well, look, if I, if I believe this stuff, I, I, you know, I claim to believe the Bible, I claim to believe in Christ, why am I living this way? And it's a great question, because it's something you should always ask yourself. If you do believe these things, then why are you doing this? Why are you living the way that you are? And um, that's why, you know, I didn't get much teaching. I didn't get in, plugged into a good church. I didn't get people just kind of exposing my sin and helping me out and saying, look, you need to change this, man. You're, you're a child of God. You put your faith in Christ. You ought to change this. You ought to live for Him. You ought to do what's right. Now, if I had been in a good church, hopefully I could have gotten rid of this stuff way, you know, way long ago. But this is what Paul was preaching. He didn't just preach salvation for them to turn to God, to be saved, which, of course, he did that. But he also taught them to do works, meet for, meet for repentance. Hey, you're saved. Now start doing the works. Christianity, that's what it's all about. It's not just about getting saved and that's it and we're done. There's so much more to it than that. There's so much more to the Christian life. It's not just about being saved and just going home and sitting on the couch and watching TV and then, hey, at least I'm saved. Or going out to the bar and then drinking with your buddies. Hey, well, I'm saved. I'm not going to go to hell. And, and okay, very well, it could be. You're saved. You're not going to hell. But that's not what the Christian life is about. That's not why God even saved us. He wants us to go out and, and do the work for him. Okay, he wants us to. Now, if you don't do the work, it does not make you unsaved. But that is what we're supposed to do. And that's what Paul preached. That's what he taught. That's what, that's what we teach here. That's, that's what everybody in the Bible teaches is that, yeah, we should do the work. We ought to do the work. God has commanded us to do the work. But the work is not a part of our salvation. Let's continue on here. We were at... Um, Verse 20, and let's look down at verse 21. It says, For these causes the Jews caught me in the temple and went about to kill me. Now, if he's teaching repentance to God 
and to do works meet for repentance. And if that meant that somehow you had to obey the law in order to truly be saved, then why would the Jews be going about to kill him? It wouldn't make sense because that's what they believe. They believe that, that you had to keep the law. They believe they had to keep the law of Moses. You had to, you know, you had to do all the, all the sacrifices and everything else. And if he was teaching people that they had to, to um, do the works and, do those, and obey the law to be saved, then, then they wouldn't have had this problem with them. But they did have this problem with them. Um, it says, for, for those causes, the Jews caught me in the temple and they went about to kill me. Having therefore obtained help of God, I continue unto this day witnessing both to small and great, saying none other things than those which the prophets and Moses did say should come, that Christ should suffer, and that he should be the first that should rise from the dead, and should show light unto the people, unto the Gentiles. Now, Paul had the same message. He says, witnessing both to small and great. So, whether there's, um, you know great men of stature, like here, he's preaching unto the king. He is preaching unto the governors. I mean, he had this opportunity where he's going to preach the resurrection of Christ, he's going to preach Christ and him crucified, and it doesn't matter whether he's standing before the king, it doesn't matter whether he's standing before, you know, some, some blind beggar on the side of the road. He's preaching the same exact message, it doesn't change for anyone, God's not a respecter of persons, and we ought not to be either. We ought not to get intimidated, okay, because that can easily happen. When you're, when you're confronted by people that are in positions of power, positions of authority, that are used to people kind of groveling at them and saying, oh, it's such a pleasure to meet you. Oh, you're such an important person. Oh, I'm so glad to shake your hand and all this other stuff for just people, right? I mean... It happens all the time. You'll have, you'll have the governor of the state or, or these politicians, right? And you see them, oh, you're, you're, so, you're such a great politician. You know, oh, I love you so much. Oh, it's such an honor to meet you and all this other stuff. Don't, don't have that type of an attitude, for one. I don't believe you should. I think you should be a respectful person. Now, there's nothing wrong with, with giving somebody a little bit of respect if you appreciate what they're doing. You know, if there's a good pastor, a good Christian, someone who's working hard for God... And, and, and just and commending them for that. There's nothing wrong with that. But when you elevate people, people's status, essentially, being a respecter of persons, that's not right. And um, <clears throat> you also shouldn't be afraid or ashamed to preach the gospel to someone like that. If you get the opportunity... Hey, don't, don't let that fear overcome you that, oh, this is a really important person. Or, oh, this is a really important person that could get me in trouble. Or, what, you know, maybe, you know, because Paul, think about it. Paul is in a predicament here. He's pleading his case. Now, if they didn't like what he said, they had the power. I mean, the king's got the power to, 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 to do whatever to him. And Paul still witnessed unto just He said, unto small and unto great saying none other things than those which the prophets and Moses did say should come. And again, I love this, this, how he keeps on using this because it makes sense. You know, they didn't have the New Testament scriptures. Paul didn't have the New Testament scriptures. Most of them were given by inspiration through him. But he didn't have New Testament scriptures to use. He knew the Old Testament, but he knew the Old Testament really well from even from his life growing up as a Pharisee. Um, I'm sure he had a lot of it memorized. I would only, I would only imagine that he had a lot of it memorized. But um, he knew the Old Testament, and he was able to use that, saying, which the prophets and Moses did say should come, talking about Jesus Christ, that Christ should suffer, and that he should be the first that should rise from the dead, and should show light unto the people of the Gentiles. Now, um, turn, if you would, to Isaiah chapter 42. We're going to see one of, the, one of the many prophecies of Jesus Christ. It, it's, I always like going back and looking at them. It's easy just to say, oh, yeah, the Old Testament prophesied of Jesus, and then move on. But... Um, it's always, it's always pretty cool to see um, a lot of the actual reference here that he's talking about and the same wording that's used where he's talking to, um, to the king and Paul's speaking and the same words are used about Jesus Christ here and what we're going to be looking at specifically here is um, that Jesus should rise from the dead and should show light unto the people and to the Gentiles. So referring to Gentiles specifically, because that's another thing that got the Jews so mad, is that Paul was an apostle to the Gentiles, that he went and preached God and preached Jesus to the Gentiles. 
that got them angry. They didn't like that. Um, if you remember from, from previous chapters in the book of Acts. Isaiah 42, look at verse number 1. It's one of the many prophecies of Jesus Christ. It says, Behold my servant, whom I uphold, mine elect, in whom my soul delighteth. I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not cry, nor lift up, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. <clears throat> Jesus was not a street preacher. A bruised reed shall he not break, and the smoking flax shall he not quench. He shall bring forth judgment unto truth. He shall not fail, nor be discouraged. Again, though, on Jesus Christ, he doesn't fail. Till he have set judgment in the earth, and the isle shall wait for his law, Thus saith God the Lord, he that created the heavens and stretched them out, he that spread forth the earth and that which cometh out of it, he that giveth bread unto the people upon it, and spirit to them that walk therein. I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness and will hold thine hand and will keep thee and give thee for a covenant of the people for a light of the Gentiles to open the blind eyes, to bring out the prisoners from the prison and them that sit in darkness out of the prison house. So here it says here in verse 6 of Isaiah 42 that he's given him, I've given thee for a covenant. Obviously this is talking about Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is that new covenant. He has given Christ as that new covenant of the people for a light of the Gentiles. Which is exactly what um, you know in Acts 26, 23 said. He should show light unto the people and to the Gentiles. Um, perfect reference here, Isaiah 42. If you're Isaiah 42, flip over to Isaiah 49. We're going to see another reference here in the Old Testament referring to Jesus Christ that he's, that he's bringing up here in Acts chapter 26. Isaiah 49, look at verse number 6 of Isaiah 49. It says, And he said, It is a light thing that thou shouldest be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and restore the preserved of Israel. I will also give thee for a light to the Gentiles, and that thou mayest be my salvation unto the end of the earth. So again, prophecy here of Jesus Christ being that light to the Gentiles. Jesus Christ being the salvation unto the end of the earth. Not just for the Jews, not just in one location. This is the prophecy that, that was taking place in the book of Acts here that we see that he was the light to the Gentiles. We'll keep reading verse number 7, Isaiah 49 says... Thus saith the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel, and his Holy One, to him whom man despiseth, to him whom the nation abhorreth, to a servant of rulers, kings shall see and arise, princes also shall worship, because of the Lord that is faithful, and the Holy One of Israel, and he shall choose thee. Thus saith the Lord, in an acceptable time have I heard thee, and in a day of salvation have I helped thee, and I will preserve thee, and give thee for a covenant of the people to establish the earth, to cause to inherit the desolate things. Again, to give thee, to give a person for a covenant of the people. Verse 9, that thou mayest say to the prisoners, go forth to them that are in darkness, show yourselves. They shall feed in the ways, and their pastures shall be in all high places. They shall not hunger nor thirst, neither shall the heat nor sun smite them. For he that hath mercy on them shall lead them. Even by the springs of water shall he guide them. Flip back to Acts 26, if you would. And that's just interesting there. He's saying, you know, Jesus Christ refers to himself. He's the, he's the bread of life. He's, you know, he, he likens salvation to taking a drink of water. And it says there in Isaiah 49, 10, they shall not hunger nor thirst. And um, Jesus Christ is a fulfillment of that. And it's, it's, I always love going back and finding the, the, the references that are referenced. There's so many in the New Testament to go back and find them from the Old Testament and see. Because a lot of times when you're reading, you don't always necessarily even pick up that it's talking about you know, being a prophecy of the future, being a prophecy of Christ to come. And then when you kind of the dots are connected for you, you're like, oh, yeah, of course, you know, that, that, that makes perfect sense, that, it, that it's totally a prophecy of Jesus Christ. Well, let's... Um, Let's keep reading here. Let's look at verse number 24. It says, And as he thus spake for himself, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, thou art beside thyself. Much learning doth make thee mad. So Festus decides to pipe in here. Because remember, Paul's in front of 
Agrippa, the king. But he's also in front of a bunch of other people, too. It's not just Agrippa, but Agrippa's the one that really wants to hear him. But everyone else is still there. So Festus, you know, Festus hears this stuff. He hears him talking about the resurrection. And um, he hears him talking about, you know, Christ coming and suffering. Um, well, verse 23 said that Christ should suffer and that he should be the first that should rise from the dead and should show light unto the people and the Gentiles. So basically when he hears about Christ, you know, suffering and being the first to rise from the dead, um, this is when Festus pipes in and says, you know, you're beside yourself. You know, much learning that maybe that you've, you've got your head in the Bible too much because all that learning now has made you mad. It's made you crazy. And, um, you know, there's a lot of people that will mock and think that you are crazy if you believe the Bible. That, that happens even to this day. People are like, oh, you believe the Bible? Yeah, maybe you should get your nose out of the Bible a little bit. They'll think, they'll think that you're uneducated because, you know, you don't believe that, um, you know, whatever it may be, whether it be taking vaccinations or, or you think that, you think that all of those animals fit onto that ark and that, and that God actually destroyed the whole earth with a flood? You believe that? You believe that fairy tale? And then you'll, they'll mock the Bible and they'll think you're unintelligent because you believe these things actually happen because it makes perfect sense that these things happen. <clears throat> but the mockers are going to be there. You know, Festus was, was mock-eared and, and just basically just discounting what Paul had to say. But Paul responds to him, look at verse 25, it says, But he said, I am not mad, most noble Festus. Now, he still is using um, courtesy, right? Most noble Festus. He's not, you know, even though Festus just kind of call, just, just calls him out and just saying, you're crazy, you know, you're beside yourself. Paul, Paul responds um, properly. He says, I am not mad, most noble Festus, but speak forth the words of truth and soberness. He said, I am very much sober. I am very much sound in my mind. I am not crazy. I am not mad. I know what's going on, but I am speaking forth the words of truth. You may think they're crazy. You may think they're incredible. You may think they're impossible, but it's the truth. Jesus Christ was raised again from the dead. That's the truth. And I'm speaking of the words of truth and soberness. This is a serious matter. Um, it, it, it has to do with your salvation. But let's keep reading. We're going to finish up the chapter. Verse uh, 26 says, For the king knoweth of these things, before whom also I speak freely. For I am persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him. For this thing was not done in a corner. So he's saying here that, look, the king knows about these things. He knows about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He says, I'm persuaded. He's like, I know that these things are not hidden from him. For this thing was not done in a corner. Pay attention. It wasn't done secretly is what he's saying. It wasn't done in a corner where Jesus Christ was, you know, his resurrection and all the miraculous works that he did and everything that he, that he was about. It wasn't just done in a corner. And by the way, his return is also not going to be like in a corner. It's not going to be done secretly as the Jehovah's false witnesses the Watchtower organization, you know, claims that Jesus Christ has come back who knows how many times and it's always been secret. No, every eye shall see him. The, the Bible says that um, as the lightning goes from, from the east to the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Every eye shall see him. And, um, and it's not going to be done secretly. So people come to you and say, oh, here is Christ, so lo, he is theirs. And believe him not. Because you'll know when Jesus Christ comes back. Everyone will know. It's not going to be some secret event. There's not going to be this secret rapture where all of a sudden people are disappeared. No. When Jesus comes back, everybody's going to know that Jesus Christ has come back. There's not going to be a doubt about it. His, his return, just as his, as his ministry on this earth and his death and his resurrection was not done in a corner, was not done secretly, it was done openly, his return's going to be the same way. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 27 says, King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? I know that thou believest. Then, King, then Agrippa said unto Paul, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. And this is exactly what we try to do when we go out soul winning. We need to persuade people. That's our job. It's not, it's not um, a wrong thing to say you're persuading someone. You want, you want people to be converted. 
You're going out to try to proselytize. You're trying to convert people to Jesus Christ. That's exactly what we're trying to do. And I don't hide that fact from anybody. I'll be up front with people and say, hey, I'm here. I want you to change your belief. I want you to, to switch. I'm going to try to persuade you. I'm going to try to use God's word to do it. Right? It's not my own speaking, my own words that's going to convince you of anything. It's going to be God's word. But if you can trust, if you believe God's word, then I want to show it to you here because I want to change what you're believing in. I want to change the fact that you're believing in works or that you're believing in the Roman Catholic Church or that you're believing in some other false religion. You're believing in Islam. You're believing in Buddhism. You're believing in whatever. You think that's going to save you. I want to show you these words of truth. And I want to persuade you to be a Christian. And that's what you say to King Rabbi. He's like, he's like, look, King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you believe the prophets. I know you believe this to be true. Come on, you believe it? And that's the language that Paul's using with him. He's given him all this evidence. He's shown him, look, you know that this happened. You know the resurrection of Christ is real. You know that the prophets spake of him. I used to be a Pharisee and I persecuted him, but I saw the light. I saw what, you know, Jesus Christ appeared unto me. He told me I was going to be a minister, and he's saying all the prophets prophesied of this. Jesus fulfilled that. Don't you believe the prophets? I know you believe the prophets, Agrippa. And that's what Agrippa said, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. And again, that's our job. Our job is to go out and try to persuade people, show them as much evidence as possible, show them God's word, so that God's word can cut through to their heart, and that they can decide and make that decision in their life to make Jesus Christ their Savior, to believe on Him, to believe God's Word. But sometimes people need persuading. That's why the Bible says um, in Luke 14, 23, it says, And the Lord said unto His servant, Go out into the highways and hedges, and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. He's saying, look, compel them. You know, persuade them. Try to get them to come into my house. Because God wants His house to be filled. God wants his house in heaven to be filled with souls that are saved. And God even wants the local church to be filled. He wants his local church not to be filled with unbelievers. He wants his church to be filled with, with spirit-filled believers in Christ. He wants his, his house to be filled. And in Jude one twenty two says, And if some have compassion making a difference, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. We need to go out and, and, and have, be persuasive. And it's, it's not going to be through wisdom of man's word. It's not going to be through our own power or our own, our own might. But it's going to be through God's word. But we ought to learn and know God's word in order to be persuasive, in order to show someone when they, when they, have, um, when they have an argument, when they have, when they have something else to, uh, to come at you with, some, some stumbling block, some source for them not being able to believe what you're showing them from the Bible because maybe they have some other Bible verse that they're misunderstanding. Like whether it be James ever do, oh, well, faith without works is dead. Well, if you're going to try to persuade that person, you're going to need to help explain that verse to them and show them a whole bunch of other verses like Romans chapter 4 and Galatians 3 and, and lots of other places that explain that it's not, you know, our salvation is not based on our works at all. And that, you know, it... it the more you learn the Bible, the more persuasive you can be. Again, not because you necessarily have, are a great orator like Tertullus, but um, because you know the Bible and you can show them God's Word. And you can show them where they're in error. And um, you know, our job as Christians is to go out. We're to be a minister. We're to be a witness for Jesus Christ. We're to go out and do these things. Let's, um, let's finish up the chapter here. We left off in verse 28. Look at verse 29, it says, And Paul said, I would to God that not only thou, because Agrippa just said, almost thou persuades me to be a, a Christian. And Paul said, I would to God that not only thou, but also all that hear me this day were both almost and altogether such as I am, except these by Look, I wish that you, not just you, but everyone else that's hearing me today, was almost and altogether just like I am. You had the same faith. He says, accept these bonds, right? Accept the fact that I'm in prison and you're not, right? I don't want you to be like me in that sense. You know, he kind of throws that in there like, hey, you know, I'm arrested for believing this stuff. I want you to believe it too, but I don't want you to be arrested too. 
And it says in verse 30, And when he had thus spoken, the king rose up, and the governor, and Bernice, and they that sat with them. And when they were gone aside, they talked between themselves, saying, This man doeth nothing worthy of death or of bonds. Then said Agrippa and Hephaestus, This man might have been set at liberty if he had not appealed unto Caesar. So here he's saying, again, they're admitting once again, you know, he hasn't done anything worthy of death, let alone even being put in prison. Like, Paul did not do anything wrong. And they all agreed on that. And, and we've seen that every single time Paul has, has, has defended himself, he's always found in this. And he's got the truth on his side. But, but there's nothing they can say about it. But it's interesting how he's just, I mean, he's been in jail for over two years now. And they just keep him in prison. But um, I went over that a lot earlier. Let's bow right to have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the Bible. God, I pray that you would please just help us to be your ministers. Lord, help us to, um, to have faith, to go out and preach the gospel, to persuade people to become Christians, dear Lord. I pray that you please just help us to, to walk uprightly and to live lives above reproach, dear Lord. And um, it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.